referencing that, even Whatever. though everything else has been changed. Oh, I heard about that, Sivan. Unreal. <laughs> Um, I'm totally out of the loop on that. I just like it when, when a mom wears a hat that her kids worn for the last 180 days. Uh, the controversy is that it's Dixie Elementary. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 oh. oh. Boy, you could whistle. <laughs> if I could whistle, that would make it better, but I cannot. <laughs> I, I did uh, student presentations the other day, and one kid did this beautiful, like, photo shoot of all these different places, and one of them happened to be the formerly known as Dixie Elementary. And, uh, and throughout his entire presentation, it he was Dixie, Dixie this, Dixie that. And I'm like, I didn't correct him because that's what it is to him. It's yeah. just because you changed the, the, uh, the sticker doesn't mean you got a new car. That's the way it should be. There you go. Really? Hate to be PC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep my mouth shut on these things because I'm the president. <laughs> Well, my kid only went to Dixie Elementary, so I'm going to let him wear his hat. There you go. <laughs> wear his hat. I have no problem because that's what it is for him. Exactly. Um, Gardner went to Dixie. My second grader goes to Lucas Valley Elementary. Oh, really? Oh, that's, that's, oh, that's confusing. Yeah, yeah. A, little, a little bit. Well, my, my only issue with the Lucas Valley thing, to be honest, is the school on Idleberry down in <laughs> That's Lucas Valley. <laughs> Bless you. you. Thank the you. Waldorf school? That's what so it used to be on, called is Lucas Valley. It used to be Lucas Valley and I went there. So but we were the Vikings. That was, was a long time ago. That was that was yeah. a long time ago. Again, Chris you must be confused. <laughs> during these conference calls. <laughs> hey, I'm winning money all over the place tomorrow. I will tomorrow marks being married for twenty five years. There are, there are people in my immediate friend group that had money that I wouldn't last a year with my wife. You mean so. she, she would leave you? Last <laughs> you. <laughs> exactly, I was about to go with that. Sorry. So, I, I collect money every January 13th, which is the only reason why I remember this date. How was is, how is the bet worded? That you wouldn't last or she wouldn't last? She wouldn't last, yeah. You guys won't be together next year, I think, is what the call-out was. Oh. Oh. Anyway. As it should be. Should we get started? Why not? It is 7.30. Right. Hey, Chief. It is 7.30. So, attention. This will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors pursuant <clears throat> to Executive Order N-2920 issued by the governor of the state of California. There will not be a public location for this participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial in information printed on this agenda. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, Members of the public participating in the live meeting or either via internet or telephone shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial nine star nine. Let's see, A. Call to order. Roll call of directors, please. My pleasure. Board President Shea. Here. Director Case. Here. Director Kilkenny. Here. Director Oysterman. Here. And Director Ruggieri. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Any changes to the agenda? Anybody? Let's adopt it. <clears throat> I move that the agenda be adopted. I'll second. Uh, open it up to the public. Do we have anybody? Maybe. Hello. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, uh, last month uh, we were talking about 
doing some accessibly accessible improvements um, for the entrance on Quietwood Drive and it doesn't appear to be in this tonight's agenda. Um, is there any way to put it on at this point? Not at this point. Okay. Why does this keep, why do you keep ignoring? It's going to be discussed if you read through. It'll come up, Stephen. It'll come up. Sure, you're welcome. All those in favor. Oh, you got to do a roll call. Roll call. Yes. Sorry, I had to unmute real fast. Um, where, where's my list? Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. And Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thank awesome. you. Agenda's adopted. Consent calendar. Do we have the draft minutes and the bills paid? We have to approve those. First, we ask for questions, right? Yeah. Hey, Bill, um, yeah. can I back you up for one second, please? I'm sure. sorry. On the agenda, that is not an item that needs a motion and a second, uh, okay. as, as long as you are adopting it as is. If uh, a board member has a request uh, for a change, then that would go through a, a process of a motion in a second. Otherwise, okay. it's, just, it's just a procedural matter moving forward. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Shall we continue? Any questions? Anything arising? I noticed on the uh, bills paid, we have several that are, again, Measure A items relating to our shed. Um, Civil engineer, does that mean everything's in the works for getting a permit? Yes, um, right now. And actually, I, I can go into that greater on my report because I have okay. something. I'll give you an update then. Cool. All right. That's all I had. Um, I just had kind of like a, a couple new guy questions. Um, and I want to put this out there. I'm not complaining. I'm just curious. Um, is is the amount of overtime for fire department is that typical chief? I, I just would have no idea. I'd have to go back and look at the figures, but I think given what I know about the current staffing, it's probably um, a a favorable amount of overtime. Okay. Um, considering okay. there's just one permanent vacancy right now, it's probably the best way to put it. Okay, that's totally understandable. And again, definitely not complaining, just trying to learn the ropes a little bit. Right. Yes, I had the same questions when I first started. So don't well, and I can, I can help out a little there. I mean, yes, that's fairly standard number. To Chief's point, we've had a, uh, a staff member who's been on a uh, extended industrial injury leave. So that's uh, every third shift that's requiring somebody to fill in his, his shift with OT. Great. Okay, cool. And I think my you only, oh, sorry. Can I piggyback on a question really quick? If we were outside of a pandemic, would the volunteer fire departments or the volunteers affect that pay, that amount at all? No. Okay. Wow. Three answers. Thank you. Four. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, and my only, my second question on the bills paid out was, um, I'm looking at, I don't even know how to count these, item 5130 to Hansel Design. Um, I was just curious, uh, like, is that for, is that for taking us to the finish line of the design? Like, where are we with Bill and his payment? Like, does he, do we have a certain amount of money that we are paying him and we're just cutting it into chunks or how is that done? No, it's, he's billed on time and materials. Okay. So it's all uh, time spent. Okay, cool. And then that, it's all, that, uh, you know, invoices are detailed and things like that. Okay, okay. So and that's that's worked into the overall plan for that, for the site? Correct. For the new, for the new building? Okay. Correct. Anything else? Uh, okay, so we need to approve this. Do I hear a motion? 
I motion to approve the draft minutes of the regular meeting from December 8th, 2020, and the bill pays. I second. Okay, let's open it up to the public for discussion. <clears throat> Any takers? Yeah. Hello, Stephen. Hi. Um, so um, I, I just I, I'm glad that uh, Chris asked the questions regarding um, the project. There, I, I did not hear um, specific uh, numbers, and this is actually for the benefit of the new members. We have never heard any specific numbers, and we've always heard generalizations as far as. Uh, the cost of this project. It is a concern because initially we were promised, uh, I think two years ago by Eric, that it would be 13,000, Bill would be pay, expect that the project would cost 13,000 and change all in and we're blown past that a long ways. So when they have time and materials, it's basically um, Bill's the bills are, uh, bill is running the meter and um, unless you have uh, containment uh, of those costs I can guarantee you this project is going to be very very expensive for the community I urge you to look at this and really try to get under the hood as far as the details of this project that's all thank you Stephen thanks Stephen Anybody else? I guess nobody else wants to chime in, so let's take a vote. All those in favor? Bill, let me call the names first. I let's start with you, actually. Board President Shea. I will say aye. Thank you. Direct case. I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what we're saying aye to right now. The consent calendar. Oh, the and the bell's calendar. paid. Okay, okay, aye, for sure. Uh, Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. And Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thank you. To public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. To the public we go. Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. I, I, I'm still starting to like trying to realize what the flow is here. Are we allowed to ask questions based on no. a comment that's not on the agenda? No, right? No. This okay. is just this is just for the public to make a comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Okay. Take a note, Stephen. I'm good. Okay. I guess that's it. 
on to the district manager's E1 is first amendment of to the policy allowing for temporary benefit accommodations in response to the COVID-19 global public health emergency. We're supposed to approve this. You're not supposed to, that's an option. Um, so I tried to give a fairly detailed uh, lead in just recognizing that uh, many people on the board weren't here when we originally passed this policy in September 2020. For a quick piece of background, this policy was a supplement to the Families First Coronavirus uh, Relief Act, which was a federal piece of legislation that was passed basically uh, granting paid, uh, paid leave to people impacted, employees impacted via the uh, COVID-19. The, uh, unfortunately with that, it just kind of took a very generic approach and it looked at uh, a standard uh, 40 hour week. It didn't take into account our safety professionals who work greater than uh, on average 40 hours. In fact, they work an average 56 hour week. Um, so we made a, uh, uh, adopted this policy so that way they could have five full days off because they work 24 hour shifts, which in theory would allow them two full calendar weeks, uh, which was in line with the 80 hours that were to a standard uh, non-safety employee. Uh, that was the primary goal with the first edition as well as a clause in there that allowed people to uh, full-time employees to go into a negative level of sick balance if needed, if they were heavily impacted. On December 31st, the family, the FFCRA expired and was not, and to the best of my knowledge, has yet to be and has not been renewed uh, as it was written by the federal government. There was also subsequent state law, state legislation um, that also was not renewed. So given that the uh, Unfortunately, the public health crisis has not waned and if anything has gotten worse, um, what staff is recommending and proposing is that this policy be extended first off until March 31st and then secondarily uh, that the board consider adding two part-time, very specific part-time positions to this. Uh, those positions are uh, for our preschool staff as well as our after school staff that work directly with kids five days a week. The uh, hours allotted to them are not the same at the 80 hour clip. It is actually uh, set to give them the amount of hours that would also allow them to take two full calendar weeks off paid. Keep in mind that with uh, a lot of the Obamacare and the American Health, the Health Care Act that passed a few years ago, part-time people do earn and accrue sick time after a certain period of time of which all of our people qualify for. They can actually earn up to 24 hours of sick time throughout a year. So this isn't a completely unprecedented thing where we're giving them. We're, we are recognizing that they are working in a position of heightened risk for the district by generally uh, and directly interacting with public on a daily basis. And we are uh, recommending that that is recognized through this policy and that if something were to happen that they were to get sick, that they know that they can be afforded some paid leave under these very specific guidelines. I have included our original policy, which uh, states the qualified <laughs> reasons for leave. I have also included the fully amended policy. The amended policy, also would include all regular full-time who were previously covered under the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. Go ahead, Simbon. I just wanted to let the new board members know that the reason um, it's expiring and we didn't like do it for a longer period of time is we just assumed when we had done it that we would do it until the Family First Corona Response Act was done and we assumed it would keep getting renewed if the pandemic was still going on. Uh, we didn't expect insurrection and all sorts of interesting things going on on the Capitol. Um, so if we wanna keep our you know, view consistent, I recommend that we 
um, approve this. And it's basically a way of letting our people know that we care and we appreciate what they're doing and we know that they're putting themselves out there. I do know that some other, is it San Rafael chief, did not do this. And they had some issues with some of the guys and gals who did test positive. And I feel like our district may not have a lot of funds to give people the salaries we might want to give them, but at least we can show them that we do care about them and that we do appreciate the work by giving them time to get healthy and take care of themselves during this pandemic. That's just my two cents. Go ahead, Kathleen. Um, I have a question. Do we really, if it only goes till March, if we approve it till March, are we revisiting this in March? No question. If we are adding the preschool teachers, shouldn't we take it to, could we take it to June and cover the rest of the school year and possibly into summertime? Where you could, you could, to, to answer your question, Yes, you could take it to June. The thought behind this being March is it gives an adequate amount of time, uh, as you can see just from the last couple months to A, where are we gonna be at with vaccinations? B, where is the overall infection rates, uh, the positivity rates, the case rates going to be at that point in time? And adding an amendment that simply extends it is actually a pretty procedural, simple maneuver. Um, as opposed to going to June. I don't know what the harm would be in it other than if you wanted to retract the policy prior to June. Is there a financial obligation from March to June? Uh, well, this whole policy has very minimal uh, uh, fiscal impact whatsoever. Okay. It's basically allowing people some paid sick, some extra additional paid sick time when they meet very specific and stated qualified reasons for leave. Okay. It's just another vote in March. It, it, to me, I mean, I think April. minus, April, yeah, sorry, you're right, Chief. If we take this through the end of March and just vote on it again in April, can it be effective immediately? Yes. To go through June? Yeah, you can always retro it to uh, the date this expires. So if we vote on it in April, you can always retro it to be effective March 1st. At this point in time, we don't have any reason to yes. retro this particular policy to December or to January 1st because none of our staff have, have been impacted with it, so nobody would utilize it. Obviously, we would know that information. You would know that information uh, by the time we got to the April vote. The state of California has not renewed theirs either. Correct. And do they have any plans to? I don't know, to be honest. Make this you know. moot? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I, there's been surprisingly little news or media or uh, any sort of updates on it other than that these have expired. Well, I'm inclined to go ahead with this because we have to show support to our employees. There's I think no more, question the question it. is, do we do March or June? I think that's the question at this point. I think it's written as March 31st, so we'll go with that. Can I ask, hey, Chief, do you think your staff perceives uh, a difference in us pushing this to March versus June? Like, do you think that, I, I totally agree that we want to show them that we stand behind them um, in any way that we can, especially when they're doing something so valuable for the community. Um, I believe that they'll be thankful that you actually demonstrated that from January 1st to March 31st, you support their effort with a clause that you may look to renew this if necessary, um, moving forward from March to June. So I don't, <clears throat> I don't think the, the reduction of a couple of months are going to make them feel like they're not being supported by no means. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Darren. You're welcome. So we're going to approve. Do I have a motion to approve? A motion to approve the First Amendment to benefit accommodations policy due to the ongoing COVID-19 concerns as written to expire on March 31st, 2021. I second. Open up to the public. Stephen. 
Yes, uh, maybe the state of California and the city of Rafael, uh, San Rafael um, knows something or has analyzed this a different way. Unfortunately, um, this is reported as not costing much money. Well, I, I don't know what that actually means, and that's not really a, a financial analysis. Of course, we want to be uh, kind to our employees and uh, especially ones that in their line of work uh, it might get this, this terrible uh, disease. The thing, the thing that concerns me is we may be creating uh, a benefit that unintentionally just never stays out of the compensation package. And so such, such moves need a little bit more analysis than it's not going to cost very much because that's where mistakes get made. Um, sounds like you're going to prove it tonight. Um, I, you've, you've expanded the, uh, this to, uh, I guess, all of our employees, I, I, it sounds like. And I just wonder if it's really necessary. Um, I, yesterday I went downtown to San Rafael and I, I saw all the vacant uh, shops. I mean, basically we're in, uh, we're, we're going into a recession and we don't know when all these restrictions are going to be lifted. Um, it's nice to be a government worker and get get your your bills paid for, but there are a lot of people suffering. And um, if we do not take you know measured care of our our budgets, we may uh, we may find ourselves in a place we, that we don't want to be. So, I guess I I would say it sounds nice. It sounds like more icing on the cake. Um, I would restrict it to the safety employees, but um, I guess you'll probably vote vote whatever, but uh, when you, you're talking about being kind to your employees, I hope you also be kind to the future of the district. Thanks. Peace, Dave. This is another one where we don't respond, we just listen. Uh, you're welcome. You it, no. Speak no, your mind. Listen or we can't respond. I don't want to. I, I don't want to break any laws. You can respond. This is a agendized item, so that's the difference between having a board level discussion and not having a board level discussion. Okay. So, and uh, right now you have a motion and a second, and you don't have a vote. So if you have additional things to say or questions, that would be uh, that would be good, Chris. Can I? Can Go ahead. I, so. In his comment, he mentioned that it's an added benefit to future employees and everything else. Can I just confirm that it's just delay for COVID and they have to meet certain criteria in order to even benefit from this? And should nobody ever meet, meet those criteria, then it is at a minimal cost or no cost to us to have this approved, correct? Uh, let me take your let me take it one one at a time okay um and i'll probably do it backwards because that's the order i'm remembering it right now <laughs> yes if nobody uses it there obviously is no cost associated um, okay. in terms of future employees you know we have 18 full-time positions nine uh, safety nine non-safety um, okay. so that number's not changing um and then on the part-time level, that is why the positions are very uh, distinctly called out for our preschool staff as well as our after-school staff. The, uh, the uh, conditions are stated in the policy and they were taken word for word from the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Those were their qualified reasons for leave. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. That's You're welcome. I just wanted clarification. No problem. I, I would just say my two cents here to respond is that, uh, and I'm a little biased since I'm a teacher, um, but those preschool teachers and those aftercare people, they are doing a tremendous service to the entire community by watching those kids 
so that the, their families can, in fact, continue within the economic platform that they're hoping to achieve. Um, and so to leave them out when we would be um, supporting other, other people, with other employees within the district, I think would be short-sighted. So I totally support this. Thank you all. Shall we call a vote? Ready? I R. Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. <coughs> You're muted. I'm sorry. No. I didn't hear you. Still Shea made a comment. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Director Oyserman. Aye. And Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Now on to number two, resolution 2022-01, 2021-01, joining Marin County Special District Association. We're supposed to approve this? Uh, that is what I'm asking and recommending. So we are members of the California Special District Alliance or Association, sorry. Um, as I kind of put in my memo there, it, it serves a lot of purpose, a lot of advocacy, a lot of uh, education and staff training opportunities, as well as certification opportunities. We, they have several throughout the state that are known as local chapters, and they're usually created regionally, sometimes by county. In larger counties, they can be smaller. Uh, recently, there's been a push amongst some special district uh, leaders to create a local chapter for Marin County and for Marin County special districts to give them a chance to network, to advocate, to uh, uh, do shared trainings, things along those lines. I think the biggest benefit of this is it also gives an opportunity to provide a collective voice. Um, time and time again, and being involved in a lot of things that also involve a lot of cities and towns and the counties themselves, I can tell you that special districts can often be overlooked or can be an afterthought because we are much smaller by nature, don't necessarily carry the same level of clout. Um, and to have a collective voice, making sure that special districts are recognized when they're you know, trying to plan initiatives that directly impact special districts um, or various tax measures, is a good thing. There is no cost uh, to join. There's no dues. Um, as you see in there, I mean, I would primarily be the person going to these meetings uh, with the exception of when they may be put in some training opportunities or have some guest speakers uh, come through. Um, it's mostly my cohorts and colleagues from a handful of agencies and they're trying to do a push to get more people to join. So with that said, I would certainly recommend approving the resolu resolution, allowing us to join, and then it also states that the district manager position in the event that there's a vote. Um, my personal feeling is all of this is a little too formal. Uh, I, I kind of questioned the formality of all of this, why we need to go through all the formality. It's actually handed down from CSDA for local chapters, and CSDA asks that they go through these levels of formality, so I said, I don't think it's needed. It's an informal association, but that said, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. It is a good thing, in my opinion, to have people in special districts communicating and keeping ourselves on the same page, especially uh, around administrative and management issues and legislative and advocacy issues. As long as it doesn't cost anything. Not a thing right now. Ah, uh, Bill. Should I read the resolution and Total, or can we just... Well, I don't think you need to. I mean, it's a short, small resolution if you want to, but I don't, it, it's certainly not needed. Okay, so I need a motion to approve. I motion to approve the resolution 2021-01, jointing the Marin County Special District Association. I second. Any questions? Answers open to the open. public. Got nothing, Bill. And then let's call a roll. Let's have a vote. Tiff. Tiffany. I think she's frozen. She's kind of Board frozen. President Shea. Aye. 
Okay, Tiffany's, oh, no. freezing, Tiffany's freezing up, so I'm going to take over for still? you uh, on okay. this one, Tiffany. Uh, Board President Shea? Can you hear right. me? Yeah, oh. you're, uh, you're blinking out a little, so I'll do this roll call for you. Um, Director Case? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Oyserman? Aye. Director Ruggieri? Aye. All approved. Thank you. On to, oh, we're going to nominate somebody, maybe, for LAFCO? Yes. Uh, yeah, if you want, I can give you, I tried to just put a little bit of background in a, in a staff report here for those who aren't totally familiar with LAFCO. Um, and I also included their website if anybody wanted to know. So LAFCO um, is comprised, their commission, their uh, AKA their board members is comprised of uh, elected officials from the 11 cities and towns, um, the 30 independent special districts and the 24 dependent districts. I don't think I put on here or wait, I did. It is, uh, it generally includes seven regular members divided between two county supervisors, two city council members and two special district members. Um, and then one public member representation, so kind of an at-large member. The special districts are responsible for nominating special district nominees. Um, you have three courses of action you can take at this point in time. Uh, somebody on this board can state their interest uh, and the board can make a motion and a vote to nominate that specific person. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with uh, uh, somebody from another board and you have a specific individual elected official from a governing body of another special district, an independent special district, you can nominate that person or you can simply take no action at this point in time. Taking no action will not mean that you do not get to vote. When the nominations are in, that we will receive in a month or two a official ballot, um, at which point you get to vote, cast a, a singular vote as a body towards the representative, the nominee who you want to fill this one seat on the LAFCO board. Additionally, we haven't, we haven't nominated somebody. We, in my six years, there one, one of our board members expressed an interest in joining uh, and being a representative on the commission and that person was not actually voted into the commission. That was the only time I can recall any of our board members expressing an interest. Um, but again, taking no action just means you're not making a nomination at this point in time. However, you do not relinquish your right to vote when the ballots are produced, and that'll happen at a forthcoming meeting. Most likely, I think, April or possibly March. Okay. Anybody have any interest? Everyone's plate is full. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was everybody speaking at once, so I just canceled everybody out. <laughs> well, since it appears we have no nomination, we'll pass on this agenda item. So we get to vote if somebody does decide to be on there from yes. us or from others, just confirming. Yes, when the elections come, you can see the nomination forms that I put out here that have uh, uh, A, what the nomination form looks like, and then B, um, what a candidate form looks like. So the people who are nominated that choose to do it, fill out a candidate form, they state their background, they state why they are interested in being on this position. All of those materials will be presented to the board within a packet at a public meeting, and you will uh, make a vote based on that, just as we have every other year for the past however many years. Mm -hmm. I think it's every two years? It is every two years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we don't need to open this up. Uh, you need to open it to comment, but you don't need a motion because you're taking no action. Okay. Uh, I'll open it up to comment from the public. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi. Um, so, uh, LAFCO and 
you know, for the benefit of new members, it is actually a much more important agency than it sounds. It sounds incredibly boring, but um, they will be the deal makers of uh, future, uh, the future of our community uh, in some important ways. Uh, when it happens, I don't know, but uh, merger with, uh, with uh, San Rafael might come up, uh, merger with our fire departments, uh, expanding our borders, um, all kinds of things happen on that board. It's kind of boring most of the time, but you want to be there when the action happens. Uh, and I would love to see someone from our community um, be on that board. So uh, I guess you've passed on the opportunity. I, I, uh, I, I urge you to pay attention to LAFCO. There's one uh, additional thing that will be happening uh, not only to our community, but all throughout uh, the unincorporated areas of Marin County, and that's with the housing allocations. Um, new housing laws basically have required that we build, not just uh, uh, zone, but build uh, affordable housing uh, in our communities. Not a bad idea. But uh, unfortunately, uh, unincorporated Marin County has the majority of this allocation. Um, Marinwood has been targeted as a really great place for affordable housing because we have good schools and we're close to the highway. Um, this is one of the larger um, political uh, pressures that is going to affect uh, the future of our community and and LAFCO certainly would would be involved with that so so I guess what I'm saying is don't pay attention to this one because it's important that's all thank you Stephen okay appointment to the board liaisons to fire commission and park and recreation commission for the calendar year 2021 uh, I see an outgoing fire commission board member and I am an outgoing park and rec commission member. So, uh, I have three <laughs> board members that hopefully would be willing to step in at any one of those. Can I make a comment? You may. I think it's fun and very informative different things are discussed um i personally will probably continue going to the fire commission meetings because i like hearing the stuff that comes up and the things that the chief says i feel like i'm more in the know about the world that we are in in our little community so that's just kind of a plug um i know that chris really knows a lot of things about the community so my suggestion don't shoot daggers with your eyes. I say, Kathleen, you might want to do the fire because you know a lot about the park and rec. And Lisa, you might want to start off with the park and rec. So that's just my suggestion. What about Chris? Well, we only need two. <laughs> we can make Chris do other things. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty to go around. You know, I should also, I should state, um, the fire commission meets the first Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. The park and rec commission meets the fourth Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, both bodies meetings generally last about an hour. Um, where and it's all on Zoom. Well, right now it is. When we get, when we get back to uh, in-person meetings, they, they both meet here at the community center. And the park and rec does sometimes meet outside and walks around and looks at various things around our community. So you get to sit outside, which is kind of fun until the fall when it gets cold. And it's not fun. Um, and then you learn to bundle. Yes. I'm okay with doing the fire. If Lisa, you want to take park and rec. I can take park and rec. That sounds good. 
Um, I guess I have a, a question. So um, this is just a, kind of another new person question, as Chris calls them. Um, no problem. What, 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 so as a liaison, what do we, what is our role <laughs> in these meetings and in these commissions? <coughs> Um, well, I mean, you can you can see what it states I, in real terms. Uh, you attend the meetings, and oftentimes you speak as a voice uh, from the board, or you can bring items back to the board uh, that came from a meeting and kind of uh, dish out on some of those reports. You don't get to vote on any voting matters that's re relinquished to the commissions, but it, sometimes it helps the commissioners to have, you know, kind of, you serve in essence as a spokesperson to a degree for the board, yet obviously you're stating your own, I mean, for the board, but you're stating your own opinion. Um, if something came up at a board meeting that I forget or Luke forgets uh, or the chief forgets, um, oftentimes you can chime in there. It's just a connection, direct connection during meetings for the commissioners to a representative for the board. Um, and our, our commissioners have been on our commissions for quite a while I and mean, a lot of times it's just, it's helpful to have uh, board members on there for the board member themselves because different items are discussed. They look at things in different ways. They're, uh, the commissions, while they are an advisory body to the board, they're also a support system, uh, an advisory body to staff. So we tend to have different levels of conversation. Board is focused on policy, financial oversight, uh, and uh, things along, you know, general governance, while the commissions get into the weeds a little bit more. Can I give an example? Okay. So like with the fire commission, um, I just sit there and listen, but the commission for a while was talking about, thinking about what happened in Santa Rosa and everything with the fire is like on ways of alerting the community. And the commission was really wanting to figure out if we could do sirens or various things. And that was right when uh, Marin passed the new fire. I can't remember the acronym right now, but it was right when that was on the ballot. And I didn't want the guys to waste too much time researching different sirens and stuff when, if this passed, the alert system would be across all of Marin and not like a piecemeal thing where each of us is doing our own thing. So them researching um, alarms that would go on top of the fire department and stuff would be a waste of their time in a sense because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be up to us. It would be dictated by the county on what to do. So it's like I was able to say, well, hey, guys, like the board agrees that this is a good thing, but why don't we wait until we see if this passes and what they recommend before we start really digging into the weed and spending time that we may not need to spend just yet. So it's more it's in, in that sense where like, I didn't vote, I didn't tell them not to do it. I just said, hey, just think of the higher level thing before. So just, you know. Right? Can I ask a related question? Is there ever an instance where we as a group through one of our liaisons would then, and obviously through you, Eric, because we go through you, but in concert would ask for uh, either one of those um, commissions to do something specific, you yes. know, like look at a certain thing or, and so that might be the reverse, right? Where if we're asking them to look at something and certainly we've gone through you, Eric, but maybe one of our commissioners could be that liaison in reverse saying, Hey, this is why the board would like you guys to take a look at certain things. Correct. If, if you are, you're nail on the head, Chris. Um, they serve as an advisory body to the board. So if they wanted the commission to research a potential recommendation, um, that is certainly something that could trickle down. And then yes, that board member can certainly uh, provide some of the board perspective while all of that's being talked about. And then can also come back and uh, report on, you know, if that becomes an agendized item, and the park and rec or the fire commission or uh, chair isn't available for the meeting, the board person can certainly convey, here's the thoughts and wisdom that you know, was discussed during the commission meeting. 
Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I so should like say too that like Chris the... is actually a former commissioner. He was on our uh, Park and Rec Commission, uh, boy, way back when we also had a pool commission, I want to say. Uh, yep, I think so. So, long time ago. so like the Park and Rec Commission goes around and looks at all of the open spaces that we are responsible for, the parks and those kind of things, and audits them once a year and then gives the board a written list of the things that might need repairing and kind of gives them a um, priority list that they've worked on with Luke. And it used to be that the fire commission would work closely with the fire department, with the personnel, on things that they would need possibly updated and things that they would need serviced in the future so that the board, and then bring that to the board so that the board would know that these are things that might be coming up on the horizon. So there's another way that the commissions work, correct? Am I, am I right, Eric? Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the former of what you mentioned is more of a bit of a staff tool and it's just a reference uh, for the board, not necessarily a, hey, board decide, you know, I mean, because you know, you're looking more along the lines of just general maintenance and those things and not necessarily large capital uh, investments um, by that stretch. But uh, I mean, they're eclectic. They, they don't, you know, they, they can uh, ebb and flow and move on. I mean, the, you know, the PNR Commission helped uh, draft up a, uh, a policy for uh, you know like a recognition uh, policy about putting plaques and things like that in the uh, in the park um, things you know memorials things along those lines so they were very helpful in that um, and you know they both contain very knowledgeable people our park and rec commission contains you know a retired park professional as well as a current uh, person who works as an open space planner we have several retired firefighters on the fire commission um, so there's a lot of subject matter expertise currently within there as well. And since there's a report in every board packet, I don't have to report anything, correct? Correct. All right, I'm on. Yeah, no, they're, they're on separate meetings. It's, it's a good thing. Um, you know, and I, again, I think there is an incredibly defined role. I think it's good uh, on both sides for people to be It's involved. a learning experience no matter what. So cheap, don't forget anything. So have we made a decision? Kathleen, you're going to be fire. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, you're going to be park and rec. Do we have to officially say, should I say it? You don't need a motion no. because okay. Bill has it's the power to make the appointment. Okay, just, perfect. Just made them. Perfect. Uh, since we're doing this internally, do we open it up for comment? Every item, Bill. Ah, oh, God, I love this job. <laughs> Let's open it up to comment. Doesn't job mean that we're paid, though? <laughs> Not on your life. Hi. Um, Hi, Stephen. Yeah, uh, Bill, I, I, I would hope that maybe you could kind of reframe some of the, this uh, your frustration in, in a more uh, fruitful manner. Uh, I am a member of the public. All members of the public do have a right to speak. And I, I'm sorry that you have adopted this, this uh, point of view, but I think it's very disrespectful. Um, <laughs> I just would like to say, um, I, I wanted to comment um, on the boards and what I see them uh, their role and it's not to create to-do lists for our staff but to provide um, policy direction and some big ideas so for example in the parks uh, I mentioned you know um, uh, park policy as far as as far as uh, as far as the trails and accessibility looking at the pool issues um, the you know when do we replace the pool or 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 redo the pool these are the big ideas you i think i think if you're uh worried about the the day to day month to month you, yes you should you should uh, demand accountability in that area but really the role is 
and it, um, a visionary role uh, setting policy. So that, and that the same goes uh, for the fire department as well. So um, anyhow, that's just my comments from the peanut gallery. Thank you. Uh, district manager report. Uh, before I forget, um, I meant to make a note on here, and I didn't, uh, and I think I made a note last time, um, and I'll have a much more detailed uh, financial statements next month uh, going through quarter two, but we have started to get our um, first round of tax deposits. Uh, as of December 31st, we actually received about 1.15 in ad valorem taxes. Um, 1.15 million and about 877,000 in special taxes uh, for total deposit into our general fund of about 2.03 million. So those have started coming through. It puts us uh, slightly ahead of track from what we budgeted in terms of this is December is uh, represents 55% of the estimated tax uh, receipts for the year. So this does put us about 70,000 ahead on the ad valorem when you compare it to budget, meaning we'll uh, be about 70,000 more in revenue than what was originally anticipated and budgeted for if that still holds true. So we're doing good uh, there because, you know, we don't have a lot of power or influence over how ad valorem taxes go. And uh, I try to make very conservative projections when we set up budgets. So, so far, so good. Uh, financial audit, Tiffany and I have been working hard on that, um, really with the auditor trying to close this thing out and get it done. I anticipate the uh, draft uh, report and management report to be presented at next month's meeting. I have no reason to believe it won't be completed. If this meeting was probably a week or two later, we would have had it by now. Um, holidays and everything else kind of slowed things down. So, um, but we're cranking right along. Um, and I don't at this moment anticipate any surprises, but that's just more something to look forward to for next month. You'll get a, a detailed uh, financial statement through Q2, a profit and loss statement, as well as the uh, financial audit for, uh, I see it says 2021, it's 1920. Um, on the uh, park maintenance facility, um, kind of parlaying off of what Bill was asking. Um, yes, this is, if you have been out to that area, you've noticed that everything has been completely demolished and disposed and removed. Um, the site is clean. The site is uh, ready for building at this point in time. We did receive our uh, initial uh, feedback from our plan check service. Um, and as always, and as expected, they had several notes, um, none of any real material value. Uh, most of them were asking for notations, uh, additional notations within the plans themselves. Some had some structural engineering notations that were needed. So the project architect, as well as our uh, uh, structural engineer who put together that level of the plans are making those adjustments. We will send them back to the plan check service uh, to confirm that everything has been done. And once that is done, they will be submitted for permitting um, with the county. So that way that is rolling. However, once those adjustments are made, um, then we can be reasonably confident that those plans are 99% finalized, if not close to 100%. So we can finish off the RFP with the complete bid sets, get the request for proposals um, distributed in the way that it needs to be distributed. I would uh, say we'll probably give it 30 days for a response, um, which still keeps us on track if everything can work out right to have this thing built and completed prior to next rainy season. Um, in terms of wildfire prevention plans, I did just, you know, want to make some notes in here uh, as to where we are at, you know, continue to work with Chief White and his staff. Um, and in fact, just recently had a, a meeting with some of them kind of looking at uh, how we're going about doing some of this. Um, there is several instances where some of our projects are utilizing crews that are already under contract with the city of San Rafael. And uh, so we will be incurring those direct costs as they relate directly to our projects. Um, anytime we move in with a third party contractor, like say if we bring the goats in 
something like that, those contracts occur directly between us. The reason we met with Center Fell was, uh, you know, in the era of transparency and to keep things very clean, uh, I wanted in a, a written agreement in place uh, between our two agencies that says, you know, yes, we will reimburse the city of Santa Fe for these direct costs related to wildfire <laughs> prevention efforts, because these fundings are coming from the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, um, which is, you know, highly, just like all government agencies, that's a JPA, but it's still high highly regulated, and we wanted to make sure we had everything kind of on the uh, uh, button tight with that. So some of the things that, uh, for an example, Santa Fe, um, you know, they had the contract with AmeriCorps. There is, well, AmeriCorps is extremely affordable. It's not free. Um, and so they were spending time on our property. They had very set daily rates. We knew what those were. Uh, their seasonal inspectors that Santa Fe hired doing all of the home hardening and defensible space inspections. Um, it's very easy to calculate out their burdened hourly rates and keep track of that. So these are the types of direct expenses that we can't pay AmeriCorps directly or we can't pay um, their staff directly, but doing it through Santa Fe makes a ton of sense. And uh, their experts who have brought their people in and supervise them is simply a resource that we don't have, um, I wrote it here, but I feel like I have to reiterate it. I just, I remain grateful we have the relationship we do with Chief White and his staff in the entire city. We would never have the resources at our disposal without that relationship. We would never have the expertise or the guidance, and we would never be able to take advantage of some of the economies of scale that we're able to do. To have the work done that we've had done at the cost that it cost us, is nothing we would be able to even come close to uh, mm -hmm. if we were trying to do this on our own. So Chief, again, I've said it till I'm blue in the face, but thank you very much for you and your staff. Um, they've been excellent, excellent, excellent to work with. Um, we're still working on kind of a multi-year prevention plan that'll kind of outline, you know, what our focus will be over the next several years. So as that starts to come together better, um, that'll uh, be shared with the fire commission as well as uh, the park and rec commission. We'll probably host a joint meeting at that time. Awesome. Can you go ahead, Savannah? Yeah, so. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start at the top. Uh, when you were talking about the taxes that came in. Yep. Um, just kind of to reiterate, we don't have sales tax or anything in the area. So it's just property taxes that we get um, for those who are new. In terms of what we got, is you said that this is a little bit more than we expected. Um, what is this in comparison to what we got in previous years for our taxes? Like, is this... We've been told that we are going to, by the, some members of the public, that we need to be careful because we're not going to see as much revenue coming in, but our taxes are taxes. And so this is the same, basically, amount of money that we have been getting year after year, correct, Eric? Um, it's a little bit more. It tends to always go up. I haven't had a chance to really kind of do a prior year analysis on it, okay. but I can certainly add that to next month's report, which will, you know, kind of cover us through Q2 and explain okay. where it is. Um, you know, I, I think I anticipated maybe a 3% uh, growth in ad valorem, okay. uh, and we're exceeding that at this point in time. Okay. Yeah. So right now we're just, you know, leaving some money on the table for events that we can't run and you know losing no money because we can't run them um in terms of the park maintenance facility um mm -hmm. when you're saying that the sealed bids are going to be opened together in a public setting i'm assuming we're going to schedule a special zoom or is it going to be in a door board meeting um it won't be a board meeting it'll it will be a meeting for that purpose okay um, but it won't be a, a board meeting. I mean, obviously the board is welcome to, uh, you know, watch and observe, but it okay. won't be, a, it won't be part of a regular board meeting. The bids will be, you know, staff as well as uh, the architect will go through and make sure that the bids are complete, make sure that the bidders are qualified to work on this type of a project, both legally and uh, 
from a professional standpoint. Um, and then obviously we would present the qualified bids to the board with a recommendation on accepting or, you know, with a recommendation of some level, but it'll be up to the board to authorize to enter into agreement and accept the bid. Okay, so that, perfect. that part will come to a board meeting. And it's all Zoom, so, all right. That was my comments and questions. Okay, anybody else? We, Eric, do you have any sense of of what those, like, what neighborhood those bids might come in on? I would hesitate to even tell you. You okay. know, I, I, I expect it to be a very large neighborhood, meaning uh, from the low bid to the high bid, I think is going to be a huge variance. Okay. Um, you know, so at this point in time, until we can actually, you know, get the plans and get the bids and get them in, um, I would be hesitant to give you any sort of a number on. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Public hey, comment? Hold on, Bill. Uh, Chris, I will follow up on that really quick and just also let you know that one of the things that we're trying to incorporate as much as possible in looking at some of the uh, design aspects of this are what's known as alternative uh, uh, additives additions so alt ads is the small right. phrase so there are certain things that we have planned in here and rather than take it all in into one base bid we can have the base bid you know more of the kind of core of the building and then these alt ads say and if we wanted to add this it's x amount if we wanted to add that it's y amount the bidder mm -hmm. is, the district has the option to accept or deny any of the ad alts um, but the bidder is locked into those ad alts at that point at that cost Okay. And that's often where we get a large variance uh, is in the adults. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, Bill. Go ahead. Let's open it up. All right. Steven. Yes. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, also start from the top. Uh, uh, Savan, you're right. Uh, our taxes follow the real estate market and uh, for as long as Eric's been here it's risen although prior to Eric's uh, coming here it actually declined um, uh, the point is not that we get a little bit more uh, taxes every year uh, fortunately knock on wood the real estate market's strong um, it's that our liabilities are climbing faster um, and will soon take overtake us as the pension um, obligations and the health care obligations uh, overtake us. Uh, so that's why we need to be cautious. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, there's cap capital improvements uh, are on the horizon. Um, so I, I just guess I wanted to make that comment. As far as uh, the park maintenance facility. Um, you know, uh, I, I want to point that point out before you do bidding, and, and I'm going to keep pointing uh, to this out until uh, till I'm blue in the face, maybe. But the the uh, facility that we have built there uh, does not allow for the free uh, for our our vehicles, our prime vehicles to move around adequately they'll have to um, the way that it that uh, building has been constructed it's wide and uh, in front of it there's a holding pond and a walking area well that's the area you, that has been traditionally used for turning around our vehicles throwing uh, storing um, landscaping waste and whatever and it's they're doing it now there's a, a huge amount of space needed to turn around a vehicle uh, uh, 180 degrees and as you walk down that area you can see the tire tracks in the mud and you can ask yourself okay what's going to happen once this building's going to be here how are these trucks and the trailer going to turn around it's minimum 54 feet to turn around no one would build a firehouse where you couldn't move the fire truck in and out of the, the, the house, uh, the firehouse. And unfortunately, we're, we're about ready to build a facility that is not going to have easy access. 
Now, ironically, where we have this temporary facility would be accessible, would allow for movement of our vehicles. And quite frankly, I, I, I know this is heresy, but if we put up a uh, put up an eight foot fence around where we've got a temporary fence we, and called it a day, I think we would be fine. Now, it wouldn't be beautiful, it certainly wouldn't win any Architectural Digest awards, but it would be a more practical facility than the one that be, is being envisioned. When these bids come in, uh, I have been a government bidder in, in the past. I urge you not to, uh, or, or look askance on uh, time and materials contracts, contracts because you have no control of cost. I, I don't know how in the world uh, you plan to control cost here. The board doesn't want to talk about cost. The board has not discussed this with the public, but it's going to be the bill that we all have to pay. And so, um, I, you know, three board members left this project on the table for you three new uh, board members and, uh, and two of the old board members, but it, this is going to fall on your shoulders should this be um, not financially successful. So I, I, I urge you to really, you know, question all the assumptions that you've been getting, getting, uh, been given and really ask for specifics. This is a very uh, substantial uh, investment uh, for our community. Um, other than that, I mean, I'm glad we're, we're taking care of the wildfire prevention. Um, I, I will have further more, further things to say later on in the, in the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Eric. Uh, on to fire department matters. We have draft minutes of the fire commission meeting. We're going to review. Any comments? I'm hearing none. Uh, I'll open it to the public. Good. On to. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Stephen. Real simple, we need more detail in these reports. This is this is kind of a joke as a report. I realize you tried to minimize it uh, for whatever reason. It, it you know, I, I would like to see a little bit more effort put forth uh, from our staff on these reports. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Bill, Chief. Can, I, can I ask a question? Sorry, Chief. What, what, Stephen, what, what specifically are you, I, I don't understand what you're even asking for. Uh, can I proceed? Yeah. These are action minutes. That is what the, the board has taken on is action minutes. So they don't, they are, they are intended to report on the actions of the board or the actions of the body or the actions of the commission, as opposed to a narrative recap of what was discussed. Okay. Does that answer your question, uh, Chris? I, I didn't have a question on our side. I just don't know what Stephen was asking for. I, I understand he's lodging a complaint, but I don't understand what he's complaining about. But I don't know if I'm allowed to ask that question. I, You're allowed, Bill. I can bring him back in if you want. Bill? Yes? I said I can bring him back in if you want. You mean it's up to me? Well, you are the chair. <laughs> After his last comment, uh, sure, go ahead. It's easy, Stephen. That's, that's easy, too. Now, I, 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 and I do appreciate you asking, Chris. Yeah, I, I would like to actually know what the the business of the board is it, it does uh, the, all, all of our boards 
um, it really is hard to follow. I, I make a point to attend as many as I can, but there's just no way that anyone knows what is going on inside the board without more information. Um, the, the board, uh, I guess Eric doesn't want to uh, video or, or uh, videotape the board meetings. Don't know what the reason is, but the, you know the purpose of your position is to represent the community. It's not to you know rep, you know help help out our staff. I mean, we want to help out our staff, of course, but but it really is to represent the uh, the community community's wishes. And so, how can you do that if if you're doing it behind closed doors and and cryptic notes? So I I'm I am asking for a little bit more detail. A little bit more narrative uh, on the uh, reports. That thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Can we go on now? Sure. Okay, Chief. Welcome. <laughs> happy New Year. Good evening and Happy New Year to you and uh, District Manager Drakosin and. All of the board of directors and Mr. Nessel, uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you this evening. Um, my report is not uh, a very uh, long report this month, uh, and maybe that's a good thing. I guess the month of December had uh, just a couple of incidents. I'll speak to those a little bit later on. Um, but I'll start with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority and some of the most recent things that are taking place there. Uh, as I indicated and shared with the uh, commissioners last week, the NCCC AmeriCorps crews have actually returned home. Uh, they're not going to be here as we had anticipated all the way through um, March, which is uh, very disappointing. However, um, there was a COVID scare and those individuals were, re were required to return back to their, their base location. Uh, and so with that, I think there was only one confirmed positive, but that was enough to ensure that um, we had to discontinue operations for a little while. And so uh, Quinn Gardner, our emergency manager, is actually in discussions with some of their personnel to see about getting them back out as early as March or April. Um, she's aware that I'm a, a big proponent of using them year round if we possibly could, despite the weather, um, because I just know that as uh, Eric spoke to just a little while ago, the return on investment is the potential. And time we can have the efforts of volunteers to come into our communities and do the type of work that they do. Uh, and if we can get that on a year-round basis, we'll be so much better off in a relatively short period of time. So I'm just, I'm a big fan of year-round use of AmeriCorps and or in Triple C if the opportunity um, presents itself. But realistically speaking, it's probably going to be you know, upwards of six or seven months um, out of the year that we're able to benefit from them. And I believe that's an increase from what we've done in the past. So I'm, I'm not complaining. Don't get me wrong. Um, moving towards the executive director, uh, Mark Brown, he's actually, I believe he's already put forward the request for a planning and program manager. Uh, he advised me yesterday that the checks will be going out this week. 55% of the tax revenue received will be the amount that the agencies will receive this week. The 40% will be coming forward sometime in April uh, and the last 5% again in June to make a complete 100% uh, pass through of the monies received from the Measure C. There is a year to date, or excuse me, year to date, uh, calendar year ending 2020 to date, uh, representation of the work that's been done for a lot of the programs and projects. And it's on the website. And so I listed it as HTTPS uh, colon backslash backslash www.marinwildfire.org backslash programs. And so that's on my report. Please go to that location and take a look at what's, what's been done. Uh, I have to say that we're really excited to look ahead to the 2021 work plan and all of it that's gonna come forward from that. Uh, we have not expended core revenue thus far. We've only received or we'll, we'll be receiving 40% of the funding coming from the MWPA. However, the core projects are gonna really be the bulk 60% of the revenues coming in. And so those are gonna be larger scale projects 
things that impact the open space efforts, things that impact, for instance, evacuation planning and, and um, other work related to things that require RFPs and work that goes across zones, let alone just the smaller projects that we were able to get a lot of traction on in 2020. So a um, lot, lot to look ahead to this year. And we'll be reporting more on that as things develop. And I just wanted to touch on that briefly. Um, and I'll move forward to COVID and the vaccinations that are underway right now next. Uh, the time I drafted this, um, just prior to the holidays, uh, we had just received the first rollout of vaccinations for some of the essential workers. And so I'm happy to state that we had volunteers step up from uh, both Marinwood and San Rafael Fire Departments and other county agencies to provide vaccinations to some of the skilled nursing facility staff, um, some of the long-term care facility staff and others who were really at high risk and have been continuously at high risk during the entire pandemic. Those were some of the first wave of vaccinations. And unfortunately, excuse me, I said fortunately, it sounded probably like unfortunately, but fortunately we were able to actually um, begin the effort to vaccinate first responders. And so uh, yours truly was among the group that received their vaccination just a few weeks ago. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I had no adverse reaction, thankfully. None of, uh, none of the Marinwood or San Rafael staff or others from what I understand who received the Pfizer vaccine had any severe reaction. That being said, the understanding I have and the word I'm getting though is that the second dose, which I'm due to receive on Thursday, is the one where folks are starting to possibly feel some fatigue and just a general malaise after taking that second dose. And so um, while things have been relatively good so far, I'm hoping that we continue with that same track record as we move forward this week and next week while we provide the second doses to um, our members. Um, very happy to see that effort. There's, um, how should we say, there's a lot of volunteering that's taking place right now. Marinwood, San Rafael, administrative staff, um, members from various agencies in a large number have been coming through and working at the points of disp uh, dispension uh, to ensure that those vaccinations are actually being administered and being done in a timely manner. The vaccinations that we have available to us, and I, I need to put that out there and make it clear that, that we're not leaving anything on that we have vaccine left over for a reason. We're picking up the phone and calling to try to determine uh, if there are any folks who had not received the vaccine that can come forward who are on duty, as an example, and receive the vaccine. Uh, we've actually now moved towards um, the possibility of doing some of the administrative staff as an example because they're considered essential workers and we don't want them to be uh, in a predicament themselves as well. So uh, it's moving along pretty well. Probably not the traction that we all would hope for at this point, but we also had some supply issues from what I understand and that given that, that's affected our ability to actually deliver on the scale that we would like to have delivered. But <laughs> Moving ahead, I uh, understand the president has, or the soon to be president, uh, President Biden has a plan to do 100 million in 100 days. That to me indicates we're gonna be pretty much looking at this as a 24 hour a day operation. I'm not quite sure who's gonna line up for a 3 a.m. Vac vaccination, but uh, hopefully there's a lot of folks like you that are raising your hand <laughs> that are willing to do so. And so, um, I'm really encouraged by the idea that we're going to have a mass vaccination uh, program coming forward here in the next few weeks. And so I'm looking forward to that information. And I'm hopeful that uh, the state is already anticipating some of that plan or maybe some of that plan has been released to the state so that they can plan on how they're going to now incorporate either military, retirees, and or first responders to help be part of that solution. Um, that being said, I did read recently at the time of this report that um, the state was working with Walgreens, CVS, and some of the other large pharmacies to have them help be part of the distribution process to the tune of 40 plus million vaccinations. And so it sounds like uh, this is gonna be an all hands effort. It's gonna be something probably unprecedented in the history of the world, but uh, as long as they keep turning out quality vaccine and 
the vaccine has some sort of staying power, I, I think this is going to bode well for everyone. I did read that there's a third vaccine on the horizon for approval. I don't know if it received approval yet. That was from, I believe, AstraZeneca. So yeah. for right now, the two vaccines that we know of that are being administered are by Moderna, uh, which has, I believe, a 94% success rate, and the 95% success rate is the Pfizer vaccine. So, um, oh, I should state that the Pfizer vaccine has a three-week window that they'd like you to take the second dose after your first. The Moderna vaccine has a four-week window that they'd like you to take the second dose. And roughly from what I understand, about a week to two weeks after that second dose is when they really feel the vaccine is probably its strongest and able to do exactly what it's intended to do after it's gotten into your system thoroughly. Moving on to emergency incidents. Um, just before Christmas, uh, Marinwood Cruz and San Rafael responded to an exterior fire burning near a garage. Turns out the owner had been doing some sort of shop work and left rags that were full of uh, combustibles on, um, on the rags and in the enclosed container, which uh, any oil soaked rag over time will start off gassing and potentially have the reaction that this one, this one apparently had. And so fortunately, crews got there. I think they did find the, the owners outside working on trying to prevent the fire from extending into the home. Um, but there was quite a bit of overhaul from what I understand. They were able to keep the fire contained to the exterior of the building, which is um, always a good thing, especially given that it occurred late night. That's another um, major concern when we have a fire that goes sometimes undetected in the, in the dark hours or in the, the hours where generally most people are asleep. So fortunately, this wasn't um, uh, a very tragic situation, but it very well could have been. And then in the other incident that I reported on, that occurred maybe about 10 or 11 days prior to this structure fire. A uh, very, very disturbing scene of a vehicle accident. But again, very fortunate individuals who there were apparently six youth in this vehicle um, that is totally just almost beyond recognition. And I don't believe that had anything to do with Jaws of Life or vehicle extrication. I think it had everything to do with the the enormousness of the collision. As you did we find out what the car was? I did not. Oh. <laughs> I did not. Sorry. Sorry. I'll keep checking though. I'll, I'll reach out to uh, the crews. I'm sure it was one of the crews can, can let me know. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so I'll let you know. But if you look at that, um, Engine 58 responded first due on this call and they, um, they put out the fire and transported three to six individuals, um, or excuse me, San Rafael, units transported three of the six individuals to Marin Health. But again, a very, uh, very fortunate situation. It's probably the best way I could put it. I, you know, when, especially when you have six youth in a vehicle that was in this sort of collision. So um, last but not least, as I always like to point out, um, for a while for you new board of directors, uh, you new directors rather, um, there was a, a going average response time for Engine 58 that was almost consistently the same number for a number of months. Change. So I beg the question, was there some problem with the data or was there a glitch in the system? <laughs> well, it just turns out that they were just on this, this, this pattern that I'd never seen before for a responding company. And they were getting there in five minutes, and I think it was 42 or 46 or 48 seconds. Well. This month, their, their response time may have slowed because of too much turkey for Thanksgiving or too much something or another. There's, they added about 20 seconds to their response time, but which is still well below what you want to see as an average response time. So these are numbers to not look at and raise your eyebrows about. They're still numbers to be very proud of. And it's a testament to more than likely the knowledge of the district along with crews getting out the door quickly. That's one of the things I always um, emphasize when I'm speaking to the members about turnout and total response time. The faster we get out the door, the faster we're on the scene. And that, that means basically don't take a long time getting on the apparatus and getting moving. Get, get the, the sheet, get the report of where you're going and get on the rig and go. 
if there's any follow-up questions, you contact dispatch while you're in route or you have the conversation about it between the engineer and the company officer and, or a senior firefighter while you're in route. But nothing saves lives more than getting out the door quickly. And so that's something you'll hear me stress over and over again. If these numbers move in the wrong direction, there'll be some conversations I'll have with the personnel. But for right now, this is nothing to be alarmed about. So just want to share again that uh, Marin Wood personnel are doing an excellent job and they're doing an excellent job in the midst of the pandemic. So um, one of the things I'm looking at is the city of San Rafael is doing a service award um, nomination and <clears throat> I'm looking to put the San Rafael Marin Wood crews along possibly with the um, San Rafael Police Department as part of the candidates to be nominated for doing such an excellent job during the pandemic. Um, and, and I have a lot of reasons why I speak to that, but I won't go into a lot of detail about it here, but I just think it's important that we recognize or at least attempt to recognize their efforts. Those awards were generally for individuals, but the city manager gave me a, a means by which maybe I could use a few examples, which I have a few examples I can use where we can nominate um, both public safety entities. And so more to come on that, but that, that's a new development from this week. Friday is the deadline to submit. Uh, I've already drafted some language. I'm waiting on the police, uh, acting police chief right now to provide me with some examples and language to supplement what I've already written. But again, just wanting to acknowledge as we spoke earlier about personnel feeling like they're supported and or recognized or appreciated. And I think um, that's, that, excuse me, I won't, I won't take credit for that. That suggestion came from one of the battalion chiefs in San Rafael. And I thought it was a heavy lift because we're talking about maybe 150 people. Um, that being said, you know, for awards that were supposed to be intended for individuals, there may be a creative way to now acknowledge everyone instead of a quarterly acknowledgement like they, uh, from what I understand, have been accustomed to doing prior to the pandemic. So just wanted to share that as well. So if you hear that they won an award next, uh, next month, that'll be the reason why. So. That being said, that's pretty much a summary of my report. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to speak to what I can. Thanks, Chief. Go ahead. So are the volunteer firefighters getting immunized too? Yes, they were included on the list that went to the North Bay Incident Management Team. Uh, so there, I believe everyone in Marin was already received their first dose. Great. So it's too late to volunteer. I have a question, as Chris would say, a newbie question. On the chart where it says Marinwood CSA 13, what does JBA stand for? Like old JBA JP. and or JPA, sorry. sorry. That's probably a better question for you or me, Bill. <laughs> I don't care who it is, but what's it say? You're referring to the columns on the left under the heading area? Yeah. Uh, I think that's joint powers agreement. Ah, thank you. Yes. All right. I'm done. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, anything from the public? No? Chief. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Chief. Thank you all. Have a great night, okay? You Thank too. You. Have a great night. Alrighty. Date of the next Fire Commission meeting is February 2nd, 2021. Kathleen, it's all you. See you there. I will come, though. Oh, good. Tell me where I go. Nobody else can, otherwise. That's true. Ooh. I'll just be a silent member of the public who listens and I won't talk. Park and Rec Commission meet. Maintenance activity report. Luke. Hello, everyone. How Yay. Hey. Um, we'll just start with um, recreation. And um, the last two weeks of December, we were excited to be able to offer our uh, winter break camp um, in spite of uh, all the regulations and restrictions. 
and we were able to serve um, around 20 families and provide a um, place for their kids to go who were out of school. And uh, camp went, went really well and we we're um, happy to be able to offer it. A lot of our fellow recreation departments in, in the county um, uh, did not choose to run camps and we were able to just have the staff and, and after running a successful summer program felt that we were equipped and able to do that safely and um, everything went really well. So um, we're happy that we were able to do that and we have plans to run a midwinter break camp and a spring break camp in the coming months. So um, big thanks to Robin for um, getting her staff all trained up and ready and making sure they understood all of the, the guidance and protocols to keep everybody safe and, um, and give all those kids a, a good place to be while they're um, home from school. Uh, we also completed our uh, letters to Santa um, on a holiday program uh, mid, mid month last month. Uh, where kids were able to come and drop off letters uh, to our North Pole mailbox outside the community center. And, um, and those letters uh, got to Santa and, and were responded to. And um, we had uh, just under, or just over 70 letters uh, dropped off for Santa. And a big thanks to Carolyn Sullivan, who um, took on the role as Santa's secretary and helped facilitate that. Uh, so that was a fun uh, thing that we were able to do in lieu of some of our more um, in-person close contact holiday events we usually do. Uh, staff are busy right now getting things prepared for um, our summer, spring and summer programs and figuring out what we're going to be able to uh, put on, what classes and camps we'll be able to run, uh, what our pool season will be able to look like and um, more things like that. So they've been busy coming up with plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Um, similar to what we were doing last summer, um, just hoping for the best, but planning for um, any number of, of different restrictions and guidelines that we're going to be following this, this spring and summer. And we we're confident that we will offer at the very least um, some programs that we offered last summer and a pool season, uh, more like what we were offering in the fall um, with being able to, to open things up to the public in, uh, with, with some restrictions. And so um, we're working to get all that information together and we'll be able to sort of announce those things um, in the coming uh, months uh, as we get more confident about um, what kind of guidelines we'll be looking at. So it's a hard planning process with so many unknowns and we usually have our entire spring and summer um, advertised by the end of February, um, everything in place. And I don't believe we will have enough information to, um, to really put that out there and, uh, and publish that at that time. But we will um, hopefully have something uh, cl closely after that and we'll, we'll keep um, all of our participants and families uh, um, apprised of, of what our plans are. And, and we'll try to have class as we can. But, um, we're working closely with the other agencies, uh, with the county and with the state, just looking at what, uh, what they expect coming down the pike and making sure that we are planning accordingly. So um, it's tricky. It's a, a little challenging, but um, staff are working hard and, and I'm confident we'll have a, um, the best offering of spring and summer programs that we can offer under the circumstances. So I'm optimistic and encouraged by their efforts so far. Um, our preschool program just uh, got back into action um, in its traditional form this week uh, after we were running a small, a very small kind of preschool morning camp um, the last few months. And we just sort of brought back the teachers and our traditional classes started up on, on Monday and everything um, was off to a great start. And we're really um, happy to see all the teachers again and, and see all the kids. Things are a little bit limited in attendance due to the, to the current health guidelines, but um, we are able to um, have a pretty close approximation to our traditional preschool program right now. And um, we're happy to be able to uh, finally have those kids back in the community center and, um, and, and provide that, uh, that program to those families. So that's been great. Uh, I guess we're two days in, it's going very well so far. I'm gonna flip over to the parks maintenance uh, side of, of the equation. Um, staff have been continuing to monitor culverts and drains and V-ditches um, as we've had some sporadic rain, just making sure things are clear and, and keeping an eye on things so that we don't end up with any flooding or, or blockages or damage. Uh, so they, they regularly monitor the creek uh, and, and those drains throughout the open space uh, and make sure things are looking good. Um, we've also done some work on the two Marinwood signs that greet people coming into the community, uh, one on Lucas Valley and one uh, Miller Creek and Marinwood Ave down by 
um, the Marimid Market. And so we've uh, added some some plantings and spruced up the landscaping there and also fixed a little bit of uh, defacement that one of the signs had received. Um, so I've been working on that and things look a lot better. So um, we're excited about that. We also um, uh, had a very large tree fall. I'm sure um, a lot of you have noticed right out of as you turn from Lucas Valley onto Miller Creek Road, the large bay tree that greeted you uh, right next to the fire station um, fell over on uh, the morning of December 31st or the night before. Uh, we just know staff showed up and the tree was down. And so um, it's a big hole in the, in the landscape. Um, we're, we're, uh, we were able to get it cleared quickly. Thankfully, it didn't injure anybody. It didn't fall on the power lines that were literally right next to it. We had one branch hanging in the power lines, but no damage. It uh, didn't fall on the road and, and no one was hurt. So we're very grateful that the tree fell the way it did um, and we were able to get it cleaned up within a day or two. And we are working on um, uh, figuring out what we're gonna do in its place and get that landscaping uh, kind of uh, revamped. So. A new project that that presented us with and staff are working on um, getting that all prepared. Uh, we just recently had to replace two platforms on our main playground in the park uh, that were showing signs of wear and uh, um, this playground is almost 20 years old. It was, it was put in in 2002 and it's definitely reaching the end of its usable life. Uh, we have had harder and harder times finding companies that source the parts for our playground. Um, these things are sort of have some obsolescence built in and, and we're finding fewer and fewer companies that they can sell us replacement platforms and rails and slides and parts. And um, so that's becoming very challenging when, when things are getting worn out and things are getting damaged. Um, it, it takes us a while to, to track things down and, and get those replaced. And um, so at this point, we're definitely recommending uh, starting to explore options for uh, replacing our playground as soon as it's feasible, um, as things are getting uh, older and, and wearing out a lot faster um, these days. So uh, that's something that we're, we'll definitely be bringing up at the commission level and, and staff are working on um, kind of wrapping our heads around what that might look like and how we can start that process. Uh, but we do perform playground inspections regularly throughout the year on all three of our playgrounds and perform uh, repairs and maintenance as needed. Um, and I think, uh, does anyone have any questions about Parker Rec? I have a couple. One is the playground at the community center. Is that open or closed? It is currently open. It with, is uh, open. With some, with some guidelines in terms of uh, asking people to limit their, you know, space between, you know, distance and, and wearing masks and, and Lower, lower fits on the structure. Yeah. Family over the weekend uh, playing there. But the one sign that I noticed was that it's open Monday through Thursday from 10:30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Is that a? That is a specific sign um, alerting when our preschool program specifically will be there using the playground. So it's uh, letting people know that from this hour, part of the playground will be used by our program. And we're asking people to use the other section of that playground during that, okay. that time. Because <laughs> that was like, I saw that sign and said, uh, half an hour. <laughs> right. That's half an hour when this part's being used when the other part remains open that time. Yeah. Um, and I had something else. I'll go on and wait until it comes up again. It may or may not. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I guess I'll go next. I know that you said you don't really know, but it's probably going to be more of like what you offered last summer for summer camps. So are you thinking none of the specialty camps that had other people come in, even though we've had yoga and various things going on at yeah good question Sivan. um as of right now the there hasn't uh, been an update to guidance on on camps and what we can do but the mm -hmm. one of the big limitations that we faced last summer was the duration that a that a session of camp had to be yeah and um you know that was a three-week uh duration with the same group of kids and the same instructor which precluded a lot of our specialty camps. Um, and the other limitation was we uh, had to have 
some isolated um, use of, of room space and, and where we normally hold, hold those camps at the, the middle school classrooms, we had to use for our, our regular camps to give them um, separate rooms to be in and, and several places to do their different activities. So we'll definitely be looking to offer as many things as we can. And if we're able to bring in some of the contractors and do some of the specialty camps in whatever capacity, we'll explore all those options and, and do whatever we're allowed to do. Um, that's our commitment is to just be able to provide the a program to as many people in as many ways we can do it. Um, but we are going to you know, make sure that we're operating within yeah. uh, the guidance. Definitely. Yeah. It just randomly, my aunt asked me today if she could do the woodworking camp that she missed last year. Oh, and yeah. And I was like, I don't know. So, yeah, then, we don't know yet either, but yeah. <laughs> um, I am happy to volunteer to be on the committee that helps figure out the playground's next life. That sounds great. And help with fundraising if we need to. Because I have grand plans. <laughs> I appreciate that. Sounds great. I came about the pool season. Mm. Usually the water devils start the pool season opening around, I believe it's the second week of March. Is that right, Chris? Uh, Kathleen would know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, exactly. Yeah. This, usually we start the second week of March. And that bef it's before it opens up to the public, I believe. Correct. So are there any guidelines from the state of California that we're going to be able to start this in March? Um, as of right now, nothing has been decided, but the team itself has decided to hold out at least until April before we open our season, if we have a season. And then the other members of our board will be working with Luke and Eric to figure out our relationship or our, ter our program or season with the pool. Okay. Uh, I'm just, so I'm the guidelines have, have changed so that the stuff that was going on that we were doing last year with Guidelines. The swimmers and then the, the swim team isn't able to happen or? Well, there's, there's two different things. What we had during fall was a program, not a season, not a swim season and not a swim okay. team. So the guidelines haven't changed, but our MSL board, Marin Swim League board is looking into specific details of swimming versus sports. Because as of the guidelines, um, yes, well, technically guidelines have changed sports guidelines and every child has to be six feet apart while they participate. So with that being said, our lanes are not six feet apart. You don't swim necessarily six feet apart. So. MSL is really looking into this. Now the difference between a swim program and a swim team, we have almost 250 kids on our team. So we can't support a practice of that size of any age. And we won't have meets. I mean, so there's a lot of stuff still up in the air and unknown. Just so we're in the same boat that Luke is planning the summer. Okay, but, yeah. but Luke, we are, as a district able to support if swim practices were going to occur or the public wanting to come and open when we yeah, open so up for what is it is it may that we open up for the public so we typically a typical season the water devils would start practice in march and we would open up to the public starting in april april um yeah. this year i mean with so many things uh, changing we're not necessarily going to stick to that format and we're working okay. closely with the water devils to figure out when when um you know when they find out what they are able to do um as a season you know we'll work with them on, on how to fit that into our schedule and how to okay. plan around so you know we're definitely but we'll kind of be both. able to open up for the public too at some yes time. our our ability to open in the like our nothing's nothing has uh changed to prevent us from doing what we were doing in the fall while running uh laps when we can and, we, and potentially some more programs than we were able to run uh during the, the late summer and fall so we will we're planning on running uh the pool season 
uh, with some limitations, um, but we can expect that we'll, we're expecting to see the swim team there. We're expecting to see lap swim uh, in some capacity, swim lessons in some capacity, and potentially some very limited, um, more recreational use of the pool. So we're still finalizing how we can fit all that in and, and um, how, what that's going to look like, but um, that is still, we're juggling all of that right now and hoping okay. to, you know, make the puzzle all fit together in a way that makes sense for everybody. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public comment? Stephen? Yeah. Uh, so um, thanks, uh, Luke. Um, I, let's, I want to sh start with the pool because um, that's near and dear to my heart as a taxpayer who uh, loves the pool and I, I've been a member of the pool uh, for a very, very long time um, and pretty much swim every day if possible. I, I wasn't able to do that last year, um, mostly because the, the, it would have just cost me an arm and a leg to maintain that schedule. So I found alternative ways to exercise. I, you know, I think it's 12, 12.50 a session. I forget what it was. My, my wife did it, but... Uh, I didn't want to do it. I, I figured it was going to cost me like two grand to to do the season, and I just said no way. So I, I would ask that you rethink um, how you're going to provide access, and if we're going to limit access to the pool, uh, that we don't do it on you know just don't throw it up to the the general public. Just keep it keep the community as the qualified members for, for membership. Um, this way, uh, you know, we're going to get to enjoy the, the pool that we actually pay taxes to support. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, we got through the season last year, but it was totally unworkable as far as I'm concerned. It really just made it um, kind of an exclusive uh, uh, a venue for very few people. So I think you you, you got to really think think that business plan differently. Um, secondly, um, since this is the section on the parks, and I note that there's been absolutely no effort to um, make the entrance safe to Quietwood, uh, Quietwood uh, uh, the Quietwood entrance to the park safer by cutting in some steps and a. Uh, a gentle slope uh, that would make it accessible for mobility impaired people. I, 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 I don't know why this isn't like front and center because this is a safety issue. This is a liability issue. This is a moral issue on how we serve our public. Um, literally what I'm, t I'm, I'm talking about is cutting Cutting the turf uh, and putting uh, putting in four by fours uh, to be to have steps to go up the, the that hill and then and then have a rope handrail um, just like you find in many trails uh, and then as far as the 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 slope the sloped access I've called it a ramp in the past that's too fancy a word. Really, all that is is just make, clearing out some space, uh, and you could do that with a backhoe on our tractor. I don't know why it, it doesn't require a conversation. It's it's really it's it's like a, maybe a day's work, a couple days work at most, and and uh, if it's a thousand dollars in materials, I'd be surprised. But um, I just really want you to put this a front burner issue. The second thing is um, our fountains are frequently clogged. We have a technical solution that has been offered to both uh, Eric and Luke and they have not purchased the fountain or authorized the work. I don't get it. I, I, I mean this is just really basic. And the third thing is uh, uh, with the playground. I agree uh, with Savan. The, the playground uh, replacement uh, represents a, a tremendous opportunity 
to make our community more beautiful. And I would love to see a, uh, a natural playground get away from what we have there currently and get something more sculptural and beautiful and something that makes a statement to our park, about our park and our, about our community and our commitment to our children and to beauty. And um, I, I thoroughly, uh, I love the idea of having a, um, a, a nice looking playground on, uh, what is it, Las Galinas, yeah. Um, so those are the three things. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Can, can I just ask a question of clarification? The Park and Rec Commission is taking up the access at their next meeting or no? Well, Luke and I will update them with where it stands uh, with them. They talked about it briefly and wanted an update for their next meeting, and that would be the more appropriate body by which to right, right. Uh, discuss such a thing. Okay, so they, they'll be looking at potential, you know, they'll, they'll be discussing that and looking at potential options. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they kind of broached on it last time and uh, covered on to, you know, some thoughts on the matter. Um, Luke and I have talked a little bit about it. We'll come back to them with a little bit of an update, get their feedback and uh, put this to bed. Okay. No, and we're 100% sure that that construction of the maintenance facility is going to block off the, uh, the westernmost part of the panhandle, um, like in the evenings and on the weekends? Uh, I am saying I'm 98% sure, yes. Uh, just simply due to the scope of construction that is happening, needing to fence that off, uh, uh, you know, simply for safety aspects, liability aspects. There's going to be a lot of equipment out there. Um, it'll be, it'll be well fenced and well secured. If there's a, a means to keep something open, we'll certainly look at that. Okay. Uh, but I would anticipate that not happening. And then if we can, uh, you know, depending on the scope of the construction activities needed, if it can happen, great. Perfect. All right. I have one newbie follow-up question. <laughs> How long do we get to be able to say that? Is that like 12 months? I'm thinking about eight more minutes here, uh, to be quite honest with you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I know that there's more into um, fixing the end of that entrance from Quiet Wood into the Panhandle, and it will be discussed at the Park and Commission, or the Park and Rec level, at what point or does it not get presented to us unless we have to vote on if we install something or what happens? I just wanted, my question is, is I understand when will it, when is it addressed and how do we get answers and stop repeating uh, ourselves? Okay, uh, like typically that. an item like this isn't addressed at a board level to answer your question. I mean, this is a more of a staff level. Uh, we're involved in the Park and Rec Commission because it's come to them. Uh, they do have some levels of knowledge and expertise, but this isn't the kind of item that makes it to a board level. This is much more of a staff. This isn't policy. This isn't governance. This isn't finance. Um, and we certainly wouldn't come to the board with a project of this nature to say, here's what we want to do, approve it. It's a, uh, a matter of, uh, uh, really just kind of more on a maintenance side. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I want to hear our community and I want to represent everyone in our community, but I also want to make sure that we don't, bless you, have these meetings drag on about the same topics again and again. So Stephen, it's not like I'm trying to blow you off. I just want to make sure I understand my role as a board member on this board. Thank you. Is there anything else? Ooh. Then the date of the next Park and Recreation Commission meeting is January 26th, 2021. Board member items of interest, requests for future agenda items. Anyone? My only question is, we had two requests from last month. 
do those, how do we, where do, do those just get put to the, to the appropriate commission? Or I, 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 again, I'm just asking how that works. Um, well, I would say as there is updates, they would be along there um, as we have stuff. So I, you know, I guess it's not, you know, I guess for these last months, I just kind of saw these things more as kind of updates. So as information is available, we'll certainly keep the board informed. And most of those things would probably happen through a staff report or, a, you know, Luke's report or something along those lines. Okay, cool. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, uh, public. Stephen? Um, yeah, uh, since I guess we can't talk about this maintenance issue, which is really, uh, literally, Kathleen, I, we've been talking about this for three, four, maybe five years. And I really, I, you know, I, you've probably heard a lot of negative things about me and and probably some other public members. You've seen how I've been treated. And this is like, this is so frigging disrespectful. We are talking about very, we're talking about basic maintenance, basic safety, basic accessibility to our parks. Now, if that's not important, this doesn't require a lot of, a lot of discussions. And, and perhaps the discussion that we should put on the agenda is how um, our staff interacts with requests for maintenance from the public and how they actually respond because I my experience is they just basically say words and do whatever they want and you know this is where some of the frustration uh, comes in let's have a beautiful park let's have uh, 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 something we can all feel proud of. This is kind of a silly thing to, to get upset about, but it is so basic. Uh, I guess it just needs to be said over and over again until something gets done. So um, that my request is is that we have a, a discussion about um, about park maintenance and the proper ways. Uh, for staff to respond to the public. Thank you, Stephen. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I don't have a question. Okay. <laughs> for what? Uh, anything else? If nothing further. I guess I'll say the date of the next regular board meeting is February 9th, but I, need I motion, a motion to adjourn. To... A second. Roll call, please. Hello. Tiffany might have frozen up again. She's been yeah, she looks like... very peaceful right there. Yeah, she <laughs> She's does. been having connection issues, so we'll do it. Um, motion to adjourn. Uh, Director uh, uh, Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Uh, Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Lisa, I feel bad for you because these always go in alphabetical order. So you're always the last one to be asked. And maybe next time I'll just confirm.